There was a man named Erasmus Brainerd, and he just decided that Seattle was going to be the place that people uh, left for the gold rush from. And he sort of invented Seattle as the gateway to the gold as, as he was making the it gateway, happen. gateway to Alaska. Right. He um, managed to, to pull off one of the most amazing public relations campaigns of all time um, with uh, the Seattle City Fathers. Um, and... And you have to put it in context. You have to realize what Seattle was at this time, which was a, an old wild west town. It was it was dirt streets. It was it was not a, a cosmopolitan metropolis. It was it was a it was a kind of a dumpy little town. Right. So if if you Just were a few one years those, old, if you were one of those people in the east um, who was starving and who decided to risk it all and come uh, west to look for gold, one of the things you would have gotten is. Um, Promotional materials, you could get them all over the place. You could write to Seattle from them. You could get them eventually from the railroads. And uh, one of the things that Brainerd made sure happened was that the map said Seattle, you know, all rail lines lead to Seattle, your gateway to the gold fields, and published these maps that showed none of the other ports that were also gateways to the gold fields. Um, now Is that around the time that that map with the dog, the, there? There was a, there's a map uh, showing the rail lines, and the top rail line, the, you know, it, it forms the outline of a dog pointing its nose right at <laughs> Seattle. And it, so, so this is a self-fulfilling prophecy because as people began to want to get here, the rail lines uh, beefed up their service, beefed up the number of trains that were coming, uh, made sure that the – oops, made sure – Your mic. Oh, Okay. I turn it off? Hello? Okay. It didn't feel on. Uh, yeah, so uh, um, as, as, um, as Seattle became more and more established in people's minds as the place from which to jump off to the gold fields, it was sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy because the more people were wanting to get out here, the more that encouraged the rail lines to build up their service and build up the, the number of services that were available to those people, laying in place the infrastructure that would be incredibly useful in 1909 when uh, almost 4 million people came here to go to the Alaska-Yukon Pacific Exposition. And as, as, as I mentioned, it, it, you know, Seattle being an old west town, it, it transformed the town by, by within um, ten years. You know, all these people that came out here, you know, uh, you think that a lot of a lot of the money that came into Seattle was from miners making it rich and coming back and spending. That was a part of it, but really, the bulk of the money was made uh, selling stuff to guys. As they mentioned in the in the program here, it was a ton of supplies per person, and th that the people here in town, you know. We're more than happy to sell that stuff to them. And so the money flowed into Seattle both ways, uh, you know, selling the supplies and for the few miners that came back that made money. The money came through the SA office here. Right. Another thing our friend Erasmus Brainerd um, did was lobby Congress to get an assay office for Seattle, an assay office being someplace where the miners who were successful could take their gold, dust or nuggets if they were lucky enough and uh, get that exchange for cash which they could then spend um, here in Seattle. And so over that, that 10 year period there after the gold rush, you know, this wasn't just it happened and then ended. This, there, was, there were miners going up for years. Um, the, you know, the, it peaked during that 1897-98 era. Um, but during that time, Seattle now is becoming a very prosperous city. And there's a lot of changes to there's more buildings being built. Um, you have to realize, too, the Great Fire was only a few years earlier, too, in right. 89. Um, and so it's building up, and, and um, the streets are now being, you know, straightened out and flattened. Hills are starting to come down. And by, 19, by the turn of the century in the 1900s, um, the decision was then made to start annexing a lot of different uh, regions around the city. So in 1907 alone, the city doubled in size through the annexation of, uh, of Ravenna, actually. Right, Ballard. Of, of Ballard, West Seattle, um, kind of that whole uh, southeast part of Seattle. Um, all of this, uh, you know, 
doubled the city in both area and in population. So all of these different parts of the city are beginning to connect with infrastructure, with uh, the street water, cars, street water. cars, electricity. Another thing to think about is the fact that if, if you lived elsewhere in the country, your first real impression of Seattle would have been a lot of newspaper articles about the gold rush and about the way that this was the place to be and what an exciting and what a maybe vice-ridden uh, and, uh, you know, booming town this was. We were sort of branded, for lack of a better word, in the public, in the eastern public's mind as a really exciting but kind of unknown quantity of a city. And the next thing they knew about us was the publicity that started coming out about the Alaska Yukon Pacific Exposition. And a lot of that publicity, a lot of the boosters of the gold rush were involved in boosting the city for the for the AYP. That's right. And the boosting happened in much the same way. Um, Erasmus Brainerd, one of the things he did that was really interesting was, was try to create um, a sense of the people in Seattle being very sort of um, innocently involved with wanting people to come here for the gold rush. And he asked people to write letters. He encouraged, wrote ministers, uh, school teachers, civic leaders, and said, have, have the people in your congregation, in your classroom, in your community group, write letters to their friends in the East saying, you know, Seattle is a great place to come if you're going to go and take part in, in looking for gold. Well, during the lead up to the Alaska Yukon Pacific Exposition, the exact same exact thing same happened. Thing. And especially school children were encouraged to write to five people who couldn't be relatives. They had to be friends. They had to live out of state. And there were these darling letters that said, you know, Dear Mary, please come and visit me in Seattle during the summer of 1909 and come to our World's Fair. And the press picked up on this, the, the children's campaign, and it was reported really all over the country and even beyond. We should talk about how the fair, how the fair actually was chosen for, right. for here. It was, uh, it was actually a man named Godfrey Chelander who was a Skagway businessman. Right. He, was, he had a tobacco store in Skagway. And also and connections here in Seattle. He was a member of the Alaska Club here in Seattle. Right. There and were many back and forth connections, and the Alaska Club here was kind of the the um, hub of those connections. And he was on his way to the Lewis and Clark Exposition. Right. The uh, 1905 Portland Lewis and Clark ex uh, 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 Exposition um, was to mark the centenary of the Lewis and Clark uh, yeah, Expedition. If you write a book about expositions, and you have to talk about expositions and expeditions. <laughs> and exhibitions. And exhibitions. <laughs> Believe me, we went through that so many times. Right. But that's another conversation. <laughs> um, anyway, he gathered the collection that was to represent Alaska at the Lewis and Clark Fair. And he didn't have very much time to do it. He didn't think it was a really good example of Alaska. He was frustrated. And when he came back through Seattle on his way back to Alaska, he spoke to his friends at the, Ar at the Alaska Club, and he said, this is crazy. This is all down at Portland. Portland wasn't the gateway yeah. to Alaska. Yep. And you know, Seattle is the gateway to Alaska. And if Portland can have a World's Fair, Seattle can certainly have a World's Fair, and we ought to have an Alaska-Yukon exposition. So they, they, they at first decided just to focus on the connection between uh, Seattle and Alaska during the, they were hoping to actually have the fair in 1907 to coincide with the 10-year anniversary. That would be through logistics and planning that what did, wasn't able to happen, and it got pushed off to 1909, gave them two more years of planning, which was good. But during that time, another aspect came along of not just selling Seattle as the gateway to Alaska, but as the gateway to the Pacific. This was a port city that could then service the, uh, the, the Pacific, the island nations, uh, Japan, China, all of this, um, focusing on trade. So then it, would be, then it therefore became the Alaska-Yukon-Pacific ex ex Exposition. Right, and the promoters here in, in Seattle, it didn't take uh, Godfrey Chilander very long to get them on board and to get the, the city leaders involved. Uh, the Alaska-Yukon... Um, 
uh, organized the, the, their um, business matters even before they added Pacific. Once they added Pacific, they very quickly moved into lobbying the state of Washington for funding. Um, having the state of Washington funding was absolutely essential, and having uh, stockholders was absolutely essential. So they did uh, had a stock offering. They sold out all their stock in one day, which was very impressive. And right about the same time, the legislator be legislature began to come on board, and the question then was where to have this fair. And that was, it was they looked around at different locations, and the one that was chosen because they could at least get something a little more out of it than the fair was at the University of Washington campus. Now at that time, the University of Washington, all it was, was just those buildings in the north end: Denny Hall, uh, Parrington Lewis, Hall, Clark. Lewis and Clark dormitories, just a few buildings. So the decision, all that land that was south of there was, was just second growth forest. Right, and of course the university had been lobbying uh, the state for years to, to have money for more buildings. They were very overcrowded. And um, Professor Edmund Meany, beloved of the, uh, the students and a very important um, mover in Seattle, was the one who suggested that the campus would be a great place. Uh, and the regents, the Board of Regents said, well, okay, um, that sounds good, but what do we get out of it? And the state of Washington said, how about uh, four permanent buildings that will be constructed to last that you can use after the fair? And not just the buildings, but the actual layout of the campus, because this allowed all that, all that growth to be, to be cleared out and all the, the land to be shaped, uh, and it was the Olmsted Brothers Right. Um, the Olmsted Brothers firm of Brookline, Massachusetts, the most famous landscape architecture firm in the country, if not per perhaps time. the world. Um, projects everywhere, Central who Park. And who had also done a lot of Seattle's parks. And system. had done the World's Columbian Exposition yeah. in Chicago, the, the plan for that. Uh, they were chosen. And so they set about to um, design a, a plan for the fair that would also be useful afterwards for the University for the of Washington of as it grew. Yeah. Now, there was one problem, though, with having it on campus, and this was kind of a snag, and there were some people that actually were concerned about this, and that was since the World's Fair would be on the actual University of Washington campus, they couldn't sell liquor. And that's how World's Fair has made a lot of their money, was selling booze to the, to the, to the visitors. So there, there were people that raised that concern in the beginning, say, how on earth are you going to make money on this fair? if you're not selling liquor. Well, they weighed out their options and they decided to go for it. Of course, the temperance unions was right. very pleased <laughs> that this would be a dry fair. But they went with it anyway, and so it was. It was a fair with no alcohol being served. That's right. So once, once they had the state involved, um, they, um, the exposition directors uh, needed to get the rest of the state of Washington involved. There were commissioners who were commissioned to go out and involve every county in the state, and they did so in mm -hmm. varying degrees. Some of the counties ended up actually erecting buildings on the fairgrounds. Others just sent displays of their educational materials and um, almost always agriculture or whatever yeah. it was that they manufactured in their county. And, Al and Alaska, too, yeah, getting back to the whole gold rush in Alaska, was very well represented at the fair. One of the largest buildings on the, the main causeway area was uh, the Alaska building, which had a display of gold inside it. Uh, there was also the um, Arctic, the Will right. well the William Seward statue. Right. And of course, William Seward was the um, Secretary of State under Lincoln, who made the made the decision years earlier to purchase Alaska. That's where he got Seward's Folly from. Yeah, Seward's Folly yeah. until the gold was. And discovered. it was it was actually you know it, it was uh, uh, vindicating for his family. His nephew spoke at the fair and gave this long flowing speech about how at the time there were people that thought Seward was crazy buying this 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 land, you know, purchasing all this land from Russia that was just barren wasteland, which was what most people thought. And here we are now, 10 years after the gold rush, and he could just look around and say, see, this, he, the right decision was made. And in fact, the state of New York, Seward, Seward being from uh, New York, decided to erect a building on the fairgrounds that was an actual replica yeah, of, of his William home. Seward's home. Uh, and the most important banquets during the fair were held in that facility. And I should point out that Seward statue at the fair, that's the statue that's now up at Volunteer Park. That's the one in front of the, um, the, the greenhouse that's up there. So other overt connections uh, between the AYP and uh, Alaska, the Arctic Brotherhood. Arctic Brotherhood, which was a kind of a fraternal order of 
miners. They had a, they had their own building at the fairgrounds. It was kind of a little clubhouse of sorts. And they actually inducted when President Taft was here, which was actually 100 years ago next week right. when President Taft came to town. Um, he was inducted into the Arctic Brother. There's this wonderful picture of Taft wearing this big fur parka. How they it's found one of his size, of, I don't know. But. I'm sure it was especially made. It's yeah. a kind of crazy picture, if you can imagine Taft in a, in a parka. He looks like, should I really be letting them take my picture? I mean, kind of like a kick me sign. <laughs> back of him. Um, other connections, the um, Midway area at the AYP uh, yeah. uh, was called the pay streak. Pay streak, of course, meaning? Well, the pay streak is, it was, it was a mining term. When you're, when you're out mining and you find that one rich vein, that's going to be your pay streak. That's, where, that's the one you're going to make the money off of. And, of course, uh, the Midway area at the AYP, as at any fair or exposition, was a very popular place. All where, the rides were there. Where they made the money off of. And they made a lot of money. That's right. That's right. Uh, there was also uh, one. Go ahead. Oh, I was going to talk about the Alaska Village. The Alaska yeah. Village. That's so there was one particular um, one particular um, thing about the pay streak that um, was the most popular um, concession, which was called the Alaska Village. And you know, you, if you look through our book or if you've um, looked, looked uh, at the University of Washington at the displays that they have up right now in Susalo Library, you see photographs of this kind of, oh gosh, it's so wacky looking. It, it was um, a, a kind of entrance to a cave with sort of paper mache snow on top of it. And in front of it, you see dog sleds and lots and lots of uh, people dressed in parkas. And these were the Eskimo village performers. They were Inuits from uh, Labrador, Siberian Eskimos. And they were um, demonstrating crafts. They were demonstrating games. They were um, inside. It was like a big sort of frozen a room made to look like a giant piece of, of Alaska or someone's yeah, idea of Alaska. A big iceberg. Yeah, yeah very crazy. Um, Talk to them about Miss Columbia. So, and uh, the most popular performer at the AYP, bar none, was the 16-year-old girl um, who was known as Miss Columbia. Her name was Columbia Inutsiak, and she uh, had been born on the fairgrounds at the World's Columbian Exposition in Chicago, named by the wealthy socialite Bertha Palmer. And um, she grew up with her family, who were Inuit from Labrador, performing at World's Fairs and performing on Coney Island and um, performing in as a, an Eskimo village performer. She did briefly go to uh, Labrador. Remember, she was born in Chicago, so she had to go to Labrador for the first time and only time as far as I know. When she was a little girl, she went with her grandparents for a couple of years, but that was her only, uh, only exposure to uh, you know, any kind of uh, authentic, uh, icy experience. Uh, and then supposedly she spoke with a Brooklyn accent, <laughs> which is funny. She won uh, the contest of Queen of the Paystreak, which was uh, the most popular Paystreak performer. She was very um, um, easy to talk to, very photogenic, and yeah. was uh, interviewed by the press and ended up after the AYP with her family moving to California, uh, before the movie industry was even uh, really getting going in Hollywood, they were the very earliest uh, Inuit performers in movies, and they rented out all of the props that they had used in their Eskimo villages to the movies. So if you see early, early silent pictures that have dog sleds and Eskimo costumes, uh, those are almost all rented from that family who had an Eskimo village concession on the pier at Santa Monica for years and years and years. Yeah, uh, also when you were talking about Alaska connections with the UIP, I should talk about the logo. The, uh, yes, they, they yes. had a contest when they were first starting the fair to uh, you know design a logo for the... I don't know if they call it a logo back then, a design a symbol for the fair. And there was a woman that won it named uh, Adelaide Hanscom. And she the, the, the AYP logo, which you see on just about everything connected with AYP, shows three women. And it, the, of the three women, there's the, the woman on the left uh, is, is an, an Asian woman holding a boat. 
uh, signifying the tray with the Pacific. Uh, the woman on the on the right of the image, um, she's holding a train, kind of symbolizing the, uh, the 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 trains that would bring people out to the fair and bring trade out to the fair. And then in the center of, of the of the logo is a is a woman all dressed in white, representing Alaska, and she's holding this ginormous golden nugget in her hands. And so that, and that that it was imprinted on everything with the AYP. When you see AYP memorabilia today, there's so much logo in, uh, on, on just about everything. Right, and they uh, recreated that logo with with people several times for special events and for parades. And uh, the mayor of Seattle at that time was a man named John Miller, and his daughter was always uh, chosen to be one of the girls in the recreation. Yeah. I think what yeah, a his, summer she must have. Historic tableaus. This is the day before right. television <laughs> where you'd go and watch watch people pose in, in historic settings, and there'd be the three young girls, you know, holding the the trains and boats. So uh, people did come to Seattle for the Alaska Yukon Pacific Exposition. At, yeah, are we? Yeah, I was yeah. Gonna, yeah, I was going to say just wrapping we're just it wrapping it up, wrapping up for it up. that, right? Um, oh yeah. yeah, oh yeah, okay. So um, yeah, we can open this up to for, for questions about the gold rush or about the fair. Do have any qu any questions at all? None. Here's one. There really are no buildings left from that. I, I mean. I, the, the, are there? Actually, there are, there are a couple of buildings left from it. The building, are you familiar with the University of Washington campus? Okay, so the building that's now called the Old Architecture Building, that was uh, the Fine Arts Pavilion during the fair. It was plumbed to be the chemistry building. It was a per planned as a permanent building. And uh, then it became the architecture building, and it's, it's still the old architecture building. It looks very, very much like it did during the fair. You want to talk about the women's building? Okay. The building that, um, there's a building that's being moved right now. If you go to campus, um, the, the modest women's building during the fair was right across the, the path from um, the old architecture fine arts building. And the uh, university is moving it up to the part of campus that has the older buildings like Denny because they need that space for something else. And um, Right. It's, it's, it's too bad that it's going to be losing its connection with the fine arts building, but we're, of course, very happy that they're not tearing it down. And then there are two other buildings. The, the powerhouse that was, was, you know, the big smokes back that's there, th that's been added on to, but that, the, the base structure of that was built for the AYP. And then there's a surprising one that we discovered. Um, what was the Michigan Club at the fair uh, is was now the power plant offices. It's been built up around, but the core of the building it was the original Michigan Club building. And then you know, the, those are the buildings, but there are other. Of course, Drumheller Fountain is one. Um, the statue of uh, um, James J. Hill is another. Right, and the, the, uh, the statue of um, the uh, composer. Um, no, I'm blanking out on his name. How could I do that? Uh, <laughs> anyway, Edvard Grieg. Thank you, Alan. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's right. Um, and, and those are the buildings that are still there. There were a number of the, the buildings that look the most impressive in the photographs, the ones that look the most neoclassical. They were all designed as temporary. They were built out of staff, plaster, straw, torn down immediately. But lots of other buildings, the regents at the end of the fair, were able to cherry pick which buildings they wanted to keep. And so they kept a lot of them. Some had to be shored up a little bit. Some only lasted 10, 12 years. Some of them lasted for decades. Um, And it was really, you know, a godsend for the university because they didn't get any more money for a little while after that. And so this gave them room to expand. It gave the um, president of the college a place to live. He lived in William Seward's house. It was a house. That's where he lived on campus. So, so I actually have a question. Um, I'm wondering, you guys have gone through all the archives at Mohai at the University of Washington all these different places to create this book and I, I will we should hand it around because really you guys have to see the pictures in this book it's really amazing um, I'm wondering what didn't make it into the book because that that's a really tough job oh gosh um, well I'll say I'm gonna hand it over to Alan in just a minute but I'll tell you that the one thing we have 
literally hundreds of photographs and, and hundreds of um, pictures of, of artifacts, buttons, pins, ribbons. But there were so many more. And choosing the photographs that should go in, I mean, a lot of them had to be left on the cutting room floor. And, and of course, it's wonderful to get to see, see things. A picture really is worth a thousand words. So. And I, I think, you know, I'm, I'm hoping there's some stories that we, we captured most of the little anecdotes because there's so many little stories that are in there. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm hoping that, you know, a year from now somebody doesn't come forward and have this great story. Oh, man, we missed that one. Cause except, except that since we write for a website, yeah. uh, historylink.org, we can add a, an essay about that great story. So That is the one benefit for, for being on History Link is that we can always add stuff to that later. Here we go. Over here? Over here. Here you go. I don't know if it works. Good. Okay, good. Um, by 1909, had the economy bounced back enough so there people had the wherewithal to get here? Actually, uh, that actually it did, does come into play. That was another benefit for not having it in 1907. Um, but, you know, the, 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 the depression they talked about in this one was the Panic of 1893, and the gold rush pretty much brought the whole country out of that malaise. Really? Yeah, it was it, that and other factors, but but by by 1897-98 that that had gone away. Mm -hmm. But in 1907, uh, with the year that they had hoped to have the fair here, there was a, a slight depression, a very small, you know, not not as big. Uh, you know, the market fluctuated, you know, a lot more in those days. Um, so the fair that was held that year, which was Jamestown, I believe, Jamestown's uh, bicentennial year. Um, Anyway, the, the you know the Jamestown Exposition, that actually lo lost money, and um, because so lucky, people weren't traveling, so they lucked out. By 1909, it had boosted up again, which brought people out here. Right. Also, because um, of the economy being bad in 1907, and because of the fact that the federal government was not happy with the way the Jamestown Exposition ran their finances, it was extra hard for the AYP uh, to get a federal appropriation. It actually took them until 1908 to get it. So uh, it was really close, and that made it harder for them to get foreign governments to participate because no foreign government was going to go in until the United States government was in, right? And just to point out how good the economy was, I mentioned earlier about them not selling booze and people thought that this was going to be a problem. The fair actually did make money. It was one of the first fairs to pull up a, a sizable profit. And, you know, even tucked away up here in the corner of, of the lower 48, people came out here and visited this fair enough so that it, was, it made money. And you said it was 4 million people came? 3.7, 3, 3, 3. 3. 3. yeah. 3.7, and how, how long a time period was Three and a half months. Four and a half months. Four and a half months. <laughs> I always say three and a half. It's from June 1st to October 16th. That sounds enormous compared to the size of the city. Oh, exactly, yeah. And when you think about the fact that all of those people had to be housed, they all bought food while they were here. Of course, the railroads were major stockholders in the AYP and were very anxious to get people out here on the on the rails. This gentleman, I think, has a question. Um, we'll let him. <laughs> I'm going to pass the book around. Uh, thank you very much. It's <clears throat> almost like mother talking. <laughs> oh, that's so sweet. My mother was an integral part of this fair. She graduated from the University of Washington in 1910. In 1905, she had entered the university, and she and two boys were selected to go east to advertise the World's Fair in 1908. In 1906, the fair was going to be called off, as you people know, right. probably have written about it. And a fellow by the name of uh, Edmund Meany That's right. said, no, it's not going to be called off. And he was the driving force, the same as Joe Gandy was the driving That's force right. in right. Seattle when we were going to call off the Seattle World's Fair in 1959. Now then, mother and two boys went all through the East advertising the World's Fair in 1908. They went by train to Chicago, took trains all around, and then they traveled a little bit by car in New York City. Wow. First time she had ridden in a car. Wow. You people that would be interested, you can look up Carrie Cogill Thompson on the Internet. 
When she came back to school, she did not have enough money to enter the university. In 1909, Professor Ackerman gave her $100, which paid for her school, full school year that year, and she graduated in 1910. She's repaid herself many, many times at the university, having organized the Women's Alumni Association, Mortar Board, YWCA, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, it's wonderful to hear you people talk because these are all memories that I have. And Sister Carol May still has some of their buttons, right. pictures, et cetera. Thank you so very much. Thank you so much for sharing that story. It's wonderful to get that, um, that family connection. And, you know, this, this gentleman has that. And think of that of all the people who were in Seattle. His mother had a special role to play. I wish we knew the stories of everybody's special roles. Yes. That's right. You know, and you mentioned uh, uh, Joe Gandy with the world, the, 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 the 1962 World's Fair. You know, the, another story that, that connects the two that I love was um, uh, there was a little boy during the 1909 fair, uh, Al Rochester. And Al Rochester worked at this, this booth, this, this uh, display booth, uh, selling tea, serving tea. Well, the booth went out of business after a week, so he kind of lost his job. But here he is, this little... Ten-year-old kid, he's got now. He has a ticket to get in the fair all summer long, which he did. He went whenever he could to see the fair. Forty years later, he's now a city council person for the city of Seattle, and he starts telling people, "Wow, you know, when I was a kid, I went to the fair. Yeah, went to the fair. Yeah, and and so and you know, started convincing people, hey, maybe Seattle should do this again. Maybe we should have another World's Fair. And so and that got the ball rolling, and that's kind of how we get. Two World's Fairs now. In Shanghai? The, uh, oh, in Vancouver, yeah. There's no. Right. And they built spurs that went off of it, for example, to the big federal government building so they could bring in those hundreds of thousands of materials. But there were trains going across the fairgrounds during the fair. couple of questions. One, uh, on uh, did the Canadian railroads do the same sort of boosterism that the U.S. railroads did to get people to out Vancouver and then south? And then second, if you could just talk a little bit more about Brainerd. I mean, what uh, sounds like quite a character. Did he have uh, any career other than being a booster? Well, first, I'll, I'll do the first question. You can do the second. The, the Canadian railroads did, did uh, boost it as much. We were kind of surprised in our research how, how Canada really wasn't as involved as you'd think they would be. There was there were some smaller buildings there, um, but like like the uh, what was it? The Vancouver building was kind of this little wooden. It was Vancouver World. Yeah, the Vancouver World newspaper. There there wasn't really as much Canadian participation as you would imagine, but nevertheless there was. I mean, it was you know it was there, but um, but but so the trains. I'm sure there was some. But really, it was the Northern Pacific. It was it was the main, you know. I mean, James J. Hill. They they built a statue for him on the fairground. So you know, he was really boosting it. Right. That's right. That's right. That's right. So so Brainerd, Erasmus Brainerd. Um, actually, very interesting question. By the time of the Alaska Yukon Pacific Exposition, he was the editor of the Seattle Post Intelligencer. <laughs> How lucky was the fair, right? <laughs> yeah, no, it's good. And actually, um, one of the people who was in charge of press for the AYP was a Cracker Jack reporter for the Seattle Times. So they had both of them, both of those papers. There was another Seattle paper um, at the Times but at, at the time, uh, it reported mostly the, like, the salacious things. So if anybody dropped dead, there would be an article about it in the, you know, <laughs> that paper. But so, and, and Brainerd, uh, he had gone, he went for, um, he did a couple of different things. He went east. He was in uh, D.C. for a little while, did more lobbying for Seattle. And he uh, ended up back here, as I say, in charge of the P.I. And um, sadly, it hit the later part of his life, not, not so good. Um, and he ended up having um, 
actually being in uh, the um, mental hospital at the end of his life. So a sad ending to it, but a guy with a lot, I can't, I can't remember. If we don't, we should. Uh, a, 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 a guy with obviously a lot of energy and enthusiasm. So I have to I have to ask do each of you have sort of your your own favorite AYP story anecdote uh, a personality that really stands out in in all the research that you've done Well I love you can probably tell I love Miss Columbia and I'm interested in her and um, have done f more research on her than is in the book and would like to do more um, and uh, another thing people sometimes ask me is what would I do if I went to the fair? And I can tell you what I'm most curious about is what happened on the fairgrounds at night after <laughs> the public was out. I'm so curious because people did live on the fairgrounds and, you know, I mean, what was going on? So that would be where I would go if I got the chance to time travel. I'd go to the pay streak. I'm <laughs> well, you know, the thing is you see the pictures of the exteriors of these rides and stuff. But there's so few, you know, what were these rides actually like? I mean, they were probably very rickety, very dangerous, uh, you know, kind of chintzy in some ways. And I'd really <laughs> like to see that, you know. You only, there's very little description of that kind of stuff. As far as, as an individual, um, there's so many of them. But one that just I just am so amused by was Bud Mars. Uh, <laughs> Bud, Mar Bud Mars was hired. Um, you know, the man flight was very new. And they, in fact, the first pl airplane in Seattle wasn't until the next year, so there wasn't even, even an airplane here yet. Um, but Bud Mars was hired to pilot an airship, which is basically this, this gasoline-powered blimp around the fairgrounds. And it was this really rickety contraption. Uh, it, it was a little like a little mini Zeppelin, you know, and he would sit on this metal bar and just sort of brrr and putter around up in the sky. Well, it was a real disaster. The first day, he couldn't get it off the ground. Uh, during the first week, he was flying it over Lake Union and lost control. He almost ditched it in the water, but ended up crashing into a barge instead, saving the ship. Um, at one point, he was uh, flying it down the center of the pay streak, and it caught on one of the flagpoles, tore a big rip in it, and he almost fell to the ground, but landed on top of a roof and uh, and there's a picture actually in the book where you can see the stitching on the, on this thing his wife was always there with him and I, I, and we love in the pictures every time you see a picture of his wife she's sitting there with this just this horrific expression <laughs> on her face you know her crazy husband knows but um, but but as we were as we as we were finding more out about poor Bud Mars after after a month the fair the fair promoter said okay we're not going to review you re renew your contract thanks it was great we don't need you anymore um, and you know I kept thinking oh man this guy probably just you know got killed in some barnstorming accident in the 1910 so just as an offshoot I was Paul and I were talking about this one night I thought you know I'm just gonna, I want to I want to know what happens so I went off and looked around. Turns out I was able to find a surprising amount on the internet about him. He actually went on to have a very illustrious career. Uh, he was the first aviator in Hawaii. Uh, he trained pilots during World War One, and he lived a long, healthy life up till 1941. Yeah, I think yeah. 1940 or 41. I don't know what happened to his wife, but but we do know that he lived a long, good life. So yay for Bud Mars. <laughs> All right, does anybody else have any? We're about to wrap it up here. Does anybody else have any other questions?